Good morning, everyone. Always glad to be here on a Saturday morning. My name is Ed Samuel. I'm a career coach with Sam Nova, and we're based in Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania, and serve clients in the greater Philadelphia area and across the U.S. You know, on our last program, we spoke about the importance of networking, and we did get, you know, one really good question from a caller that I want to touch on before we move in today's program about internal recruiters. And the question came from um, Michael from Lancaster, and he, he asked me this question. He said, Ed, you know, I go to networking meetings, and it seems like I meet new people, but I don't get any leads to really help my cause. The others seem to get more leads than me. Can I be doing something wrong? Question mark. So, you know, it's it's something that happens um, on occasion, and 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 here's my answer. Um, and I'm going to give you a, a, a comprehensive answer around this because it really also summarizes, I, I guess, what we talked about last week. And it will get, be a really good tip for anyone who's doing networking or going to networking events. So let me let me start off with, you know, attire. Um, as crazy as it sounds, make sure you're always in business casual um, and you're sharp. You know, you're looking sharp. Uh, no wrinkled shirts. Um, pretty important. You know, arrive early at networking events. Don't arrive late. I've seen people arrive late. Five minutes late, 10 minutes late, 15 minutes after the meeting starts. Now, sometimes it can't be avoided, but you really want to be there early, get a seat at the table. And um, again, those things are, are viewed positively by the people there. Um, have your one pager, what's known as a one pager, ready to go. And if you go to an event and, and, and someone says to you, hey, bring 20 copies, Bring 25. If somebody says bring 25 copies, bring 30. If they say bring 30, bring 35. Well, not good at all when uh, there's 20 people there and you only brought five handouts. Uh, you're really hurting yourself in terms of uh, getting leads at that meeting. Now, before or after break or, or during break or before the meeting, after the meeting, make sure you're networking with new people, uh, people that you don't know. Go out of your way to say hello to somebody that you don't know. And if you do meet somebody, ask him or her for their business card and make sure you have one to give to them as well. That's part of the experience. It's part of you building a relationship with somebody at a networking event. Now, when it's your time to talk, you have to bring your A game. It's not a C game or a B game. People don't realize that, you know, many executive forms that I'm at you know, there's a person sitting next to them. You know, they're making, you know, their 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 normal salary is six hundred thousand dollars a year, and they have run billion dollar enterprises, and they're sitting next to somebody else who might be another executive. But um, you know, you have to remember these people that are at these meetings. They they've they've led and they've seen a players in their day. And you want to bring an A game if you want that person to help you or give you leads. Now, when it comes your time to talk, make sure you give a crisp two-minute overview, really nice overview of your career, but no more than two minutes. As you go more than two minutes, you start to lose your audience. Let people understand, you know, where, you know, where, where do you want to go from here, whether you can relocate, but most importantly, specifically names of firms you are targeting. And I've seen this happen, you know, a dozens of times where if you don't put a name down uh, and say, well, can you help me out? I'm looking to work for somebody, you know, a small company or a big company, um, but a person who gives a specific name, it, oh, wow, does it help? Um, in fact, I, I would contend that by giving a name, it will help you about 75% more than when you don't have a name of a firm that you're trying to get a lead on. Now, one of the other factors that plays big in this is making sure you follow up. So if you go to a networking meeting and someone gives you a lead or two or three people give you leads and another 30 days go by and you go back to that networking meeting and you did not follow up on those leads, uh, it's a really not such a good thing ever because what happens is that the person – may have more leads for you and they're not going to you're not going to get them. You're not going to get them any longer because if you don't follow up on a lead, then people aren't going to continue to invest in you. That's another big factor. Um, 
Another one is is you you've met 20 people but you don't connect with all of them after the meeting. You don't even link up with them on LinkedIn and and make it hey it was great meeting you. Let's connect. See all of this is about bringing in an A game and everything that you do at a networking event. And you know Michael from Lancaster, I'm not saying yet that you're not doing these things, but I can tell you for the people that I've met and over 125 executive level forums that I've led and networking forums that I've led, I could tell you the people that do these things very well, they tend to get way more leads than the others. And certainly the quality of the networking event that you go to uh, plays a, uh, a certain uh, a certain role in all this and not all networking events are equal. But so that's... Um, that's that's a comprehensive uh, answer, Michael, to your question. I'm hoping that will help. So let's um, move into you know this whole world of internal recruiters. Now, I've had the good fortune of playing multiple roles in my career. I've hired hundreds of people in corporate America um, over a span of about 20, 28, 29 years. And I've worked with a lot of internal recruiters for the companies I've worked at. I've also literally have led a large internal recruiting team for a billion dollar medical device firm for a few years. And I, and I know well what, um, what's expected there. Now, the reason I'm sharing some insight about the world of internal recruiters is because for people who are counting on them to optimize, you know, uh, their career, I want you to understand their world so your eyes are completely wide open. Um, and at one level, you don't become dismayed as much as, you know, not being naive to it. And, um, and there's things that will benefit you, and there are things that do not benefit you that we're going to cover now. So, you know, in this world of um, uh, internal recruiters, you know, let's, let's talk about uh, uh, some of the good news. The good news is, you know, for, let's say on average for every 120 uh, people that apply for a role, 20% will get some form of an interview. And that could be on the high end. Um, I've seen the number as low as 10%. But they get some form of a screening interview. Um, but the bad news is the other 80%, you'll, you, you'll, no, you'll never get a phone call. Uh, no one will call you. You'll never get a note back. Uh, you might get a computer note. But, you know, that's that's part of the nature of the beast when you're applying online and you're working with internal recruiters. Overall, there's a statistic out there that says, well, 20%, you know, of the resumes, you know, might get looked at and you might get a phone call. Now, the other lower statistic is 2% of those uh, resumes will actually end up getting in front of a hiring manager. Um, but, you know, what I want to do is I want to step back um, a little bit and talk about you know, internal recruiters um, and how they operate and and one has some of the challenges that are there for them. And, and, and I know a lot of really, really good internal recruiters and, and, but uh, some of the burden that that's placed on them is, is, is a bit crazy. So here's an example. You know, I, I did a, uh, an analysis a few years back of, um, and I looked at benchmarks for what internal recruiters should carry in terms of the number of requisitions that they try to fill uh, or should be filling. And it was for, you know, a billion dollar firm uh, with, you know, X thousands of people. And, and these are unique jobs. This isn't, you know, these aren't jobs where we're trying to fill, uh, you know, a hundred um, uh, manufacturing roles all at the same time. But these are unique jobs, marketing manager, scientist, um, IT director, these, you know, accounting manager. These are all unique jobs. And what I came up with uh, at the time looking at the benchmarks was that, you know, each internal recruiter, you know, in a mid-sized, you know, to large corporation should be carrying about 12 open requisitions at any given time. Um, and yet you might be applying, applying for a position at a firm when that internal recruiter doesn't have 12 unique open positions, they might be burdened with 50, 60, and I've seen as high as 70 unique roles that an organization is put on that recruiter to fill. Um, and, and, and they're doing the best that, you know, that they can, but it's simply, 
it will never work in terms of that person being responsive to your inquiries or uh, or even being able to respond to the to screen the resumes fast enough uh, simply because you know they're they should be at twelve and and they're being burdened with fifty or more. So part of the nature of the beast here is that the load of an internal recruiter could be completely. Um, outlandish and yet it affects you know everyone who's trying to optimize their career and apply for that job um, many times um, these same recruiters you know they it's like they have a gun to their head uh, you know they need to fill these positions as quickly as possible and and they're under great pressure um, and and yet you know quality suffers um, and one of the greatest uh, um, uh, really one of the greatest issues that 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 come of this is that they have zero and i mean zero time to provide candidates any kind of a quality update or feedback and it's probably it, it's the number one complaint even when i was leading the recruiting team um the number one complaint is hey you know we applied we never heard back we applied we never heard back well one of the reasons when you're um carrying uh, too many requisitions is they don't have the time to even remotely give you feedback. Now, the other thing is that, you know, some firms, they pride themselves on, you know, what's, you know, what, what, what they call running a full desk for that internal recruiter. Now, what does a full desk mean for an internal recruiter? Here's what it means. They need to qualify the jobs with the hiring managers, make sure they understand the detailed specifications of what he or she is really looking for. They need to post the jobs on the job boards. They need to set criteria for how they're going to do the job search. They need to screen the resumes. They need to screen candidates. They need to coordinate interviews. They need to interview candidates, negotiate, and close on a job offer, and in some cases actually do the background checks, clear the candidates, and arrange for onboarding. Now imagine having someone being burdened with that and then adding 49 other positions all at the same time. It's fairly, um, it's fairly crazy. Um, and, and the sad part about that is that, you know, someone's making a decision at some of these firms to do just that because they think they're being wise and saving money. Look how lean our recruiting team is. Yet the cost, uh, the irony is yet the cost of not filling a position pales in comparison to what the HR department is saving. Now, sometimes, to be fair to the HR leadership, uh, they're under great pressure from the business to keep costs down, but yet uh, they have one of the greatest arguments that could ever be made about making sure that that rec load is, 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 is low enough to be able to fill these positions. Let me give you an example. This is a real-life example. There's a recruiter with 42 open requisitions. One of those open requisitions is a critical to the company's success. It's, a, it, it's, it's tied to a new product that's being developed. And, and getting that person on board means that this company is going to generate about a million dollars of revenue a year. Yet the position goes unfilled for 10 months because someone thought they were going to save money in the recruiting team by keeping it lean and having those recruiters uh, have really high rec counts. Well, what happened in this particular example, the company lost $1 million in that year and the in, instead of hiring another recruiter at $100,000. Uh, it makes no sense at all. The cost of seeing positions unfilled because of keeping the recruiting ranks lean makes no sense from a business standpoint. Yet the people who suffer are the people who also are applying for jobs. Like you out there who are applying, trying to optimize your career, you're trying to apply for a job and you might be the best fit, but literally um, the internal recruiters don't have enough time to get to all the requisitions and thus you get frustrated because you never hear back. Um, now, there are so many times that I've heard countless stories of, hey, I have applied and I've never heard anything back. I would say that happens at least 80% of the time, maybe 90% of the time. It's horrendous, but it's also part of the model. 
of what um, what's out there that you have to deal with. Now, I'm going to share with you what I believe, you know, are 13 things to really be aware of. I just kind of gave you kind of set the stage. And I'm going to talk about 13 things internal recruiters and employers um, have going on that can affect you as a candidate or you as someone trying to optimize your career by applying for a job at that company. Now, these rules don't apply to any, you know, to all companies. Um, some, some, some do, some don't. But here are 13 things I really want to go through with you to, uh, to continue to paint this picture. So number one is, let's go back to the nature of the beast. Yep, if 100 people apply, 20% may get screened. You may get in, you may not. Um, but as a rule, though, because if, you're, if, if these internal recruiters are under such um, um, tight time constraints, applying for a job early versus later will benefit you as a rule. Setting flags up so that when jobs become open and you're a great fit, I would urge you to apply sooner rather than later because of the pressures that internal recruiters are under. If they see you sooner, you have a greater probability of, of, of coming in and being part of that 20% that gets screened. So that's number one. Number two, now... Um, you might be dealing with a firm that I just mentioned that think they're doing a noble thing simply by giving a recruiter just way too much work to do. And just remember, they do not have the time to communicate with you. And as much as you might get frustrated, it's the nature of the beast. And it um, exasperates itself greatly for those internal recruiters who have rec requisition loads that are just unmanageable. Now, number three... For those firms that work with the federal government, um, there is a, there's additional criteria um, that they have to follow. And if those internal recruiters and those firms don't follow the additional criteria placed on them, they can be fined and create uh, a major disruption to the organizations. Uh, and that has happened over the years. Now, what I'm talking about is that um, they're under additional guidelines. So when these firms that work with the federal government, when they post a position, they actually have to track how they went about the search process. In fact, they also have to note up front before they even begin a job search, the criteria they're going to use to conduct the job search. And the minimum specifications become even more important than other firms. So here's what happens. Uh, a recruiter says, okay, I'm going to use this criteria. The first 50 resumes that come across my desk, I'm going to go through them in order, and I'm going to stop at requisition number 50, and I'm going to make my decisions. Now, if you happen to be the candidate that applies late or two weeks later, and you become candidate number 51, from a technical standpoint, that recruiter cannot just grab your resume, open it up, and have you leapfrog the rest. They have to clear out the first 50. Then they have to basically um, exhaust all 50 before they can set new criteria. But what they can't do is bring you into the mix, even if you're the best qualified candidate. And in this particular example, they couldn't bring you into the mix, even if the hiring manager said bring you into the mix. What would they would have to do, literally, is cancel the requisition, tell everybody else that's applied, hey, we've canceled the role, and they would have to repost the requisition and change their criteria now from number one to maybe 75, call that person up, candidate number 51, and ask them to apply as soon as possible so they get in that next list of criteria, and then they're brought in to be interviewed. Uh, very, very challenging, um, probably too much detail at one level, but I'm just letting you know that when you think that a firm that deals with the federal government could come in and just change their criteria because you're a great candidate, um, there are restrictions around that. And those internal recruiters that are following those restrictions have very little flexibility 
And many of them, if they already have candidates in the pipeline, are not going to cancel a requisition and repost it just to get you into the fray. Now, let's go to number four. Number four, uh, about 50% of the firms that are mid to large firms in the United States today, they use applicant tracking system. Uh, some type of applicant tracking system that's, that's a screening software. And they can easily find, you know, um, that your resume gets rejected if you don't meet the, quali the, the, the minimum qualifications of the role. Um, if your resume is poorly put together, that could be a factor. There's even uh, something called the fluff meter that's out there. A fluff meter is when a resume has all these uh, words that have no bearing on um, your accomplishments. Highly energetic, great listener, strong team leader, uh, highly this, highly that. Um, and your resume could literally get rejected because of the fluff meter. Um, I kind of like that. Uh, I like to see resumes get rejected uh, when I when there's too much fluff because I'm not a, a big fluff person. Uh, if you heard my, uh, my program on resumes, uh, um, a couple months back. But there is a great tool out there uh, that you can use. It's called, um, go, you know, jobscan.co, www.jobscan.co. Um, feel free to go in. I think you could do a trial test for free of your resume. But this is the type of scanning software that companies are using to um, call out resumes. Um, but um, fifty percent of the firms are using this type of scanning software. Now, number five. Number five is um, a lot of states uh, in the U.S. will allow you to use what's known as a short list. These are referrals. This kind of an internal referral list, and these are people that have networked themselves into the firm, and they go on this short list. And then what happens is when a when a requisition comes uh, come up, a job get needs to be filled. Internal recruiters can go to the short list and pull candidates from that list first, ask them to come in and apply, and they can get hired. And I actually worked for a firm where that was actually the case. That's how we literally hired most of the people through, uh, through that referral list, and that's called networking. Now, number six, this is where it doesn't get so pretty. Some firms post what's known as ghost jobs. These are jobs that don't exist at all. You may get screened. But it's really to fill the pipeline with candidates, but these jobs don't even exist yet. They might exist a month from now, two months from now, three months from now, but they don't exist today. And you're led to believe that they do exist, and then you never hear anything back. Well, that's because the job doesn't exist to begin with. Pretty unethical. Uh, don't support this in any way, shape, or form. Um, and anytime I've seen it, um, I've tried to shut it down or not support it in any shape or form. But there are firms to do that. Um, now, the other thing that happens on firms, um, some firms will post um, on a job board um, for 30 days. And then what happens is that the internal recruiter forgets to unmark the box. And what happens is the job literally gets posted again a second time. It could be on Career Builder, on any of the boards. And what happens is that when it goes posting a second time, the job's already been filled. And it's all because an internal recruiter did not click a box. That happens. Uh, maybe not a lot, but it happens. Now, the other one that's a big, um, uh, a big one for me is that's – Many internal recruiting firms will never tell you kind of where you stand in the interview process. For many internal recruiters, you become plan B because they already have a plan A in place. Um, I only know of one firm, and it was a firm in New Jersey who was really straight up about this. They actually would tell their candidates, hey, you're in round A, you're in round B, you're in round C. Uh, and they would tell you, hey, we have people in interviewing in the final round. If you want to throw your name in, we'll take you in. But you'll be in kind of the C category. Um, and you may get an interview if all the A's don't work out and the B's don't work out. Or you might be in the B. And if you interview, uh, if you apply early, you might be in the A round. Most internal recruiters, most firms will not do that. Uh, most firms won't be that straight up with you. Um, so therefore, it's not an even playing field. But you could certainly ask the recruiter, um, do you, you know, am I part of a plan A round, plan B round? Uh, 
Some of them will tell you, some of them won't tell you, some of them might even be, be surprised that you even know to ask the question, but it's not a fair dog fight. Um, I wish it was. Now, here's another rule, mostly driven by legal at m many firms. If you don't get accepted, uh, things are not working out well. Uh, everybody says to me, hey, Ed, you know, I asked, hey, you know, what, what did I do wrong? And most legal teams will advise the recruiting firm not to say anything. Uh, and that's just to keep them out of legal hot water. So you really will not get honest or solid feedback because they are scared that if you if the recruiting team actually gave you the real feedback, uh, that you could use that against them in some way, shape, or form, which is not good. Uh, it's just a part of the beast. Now, the other thing is that you know, when I led recruiting teams and when I hired people, when interviews go really well and you're not a plan B candidate, you should expect to hear something positive within 24 to 48 hours that things are looking good because they really do want to hire you. When you don't, it's almost an assured thing that you become a plan B. And most internal recruiters will never tell you that you're plan B because they are scared that if you told them that, uh, they'd lose you in case they need you. So one of the challenges is that, you know, the internal recruiter will keep you kind of in the dark until their plan A, uh, that job is negotiated and they, it's accepted. And then they'll tell you, you know, they chose someone else. One more point, most firms make conditional job offers, so never, ever quit your job until you get the all clear from the internal recruiter. And a conditional job offer means that everything's pending until references are checked, background checks are done. Always, always ask an internal recruiter timing and next steps. Um, are we days away, weeks away, months away? They should have some understanding to give you a truthful answer. And don't hesitate to follow up with the head of recruiting. If that recruiter does not respond after you make one or two emails a couple of weeks later, a couple of phone calls, two weeks go by, you hear nothing, go to the recruiter's manager. I had someone do this most recently, and, end up, and guess what ended up happening? Um, they, uh, they had fired the recruiter, and you would never have known unless you went to the recruiter's manager. So, And then here's the last point. Last point, internal recruiters have absolutely no authority to tell you to not build a relationship with the hiring manager. I had a, uh, um, a leader of talent acquisition at, at a pharmaceutical firm um, actually tell me one time, no, you're forbidden to talk to the hiring manager. And uh, that's ludicrous. Do not let an internal recruiter ever tell you you can't build a relationship with a hiring manager. So those are some of the key points uh, that I want you to um, think about um, when it comes to internal recruiters, not to dismay you. Um, but remember, when you apply for a job, 80% uh, of the time, you know, you won't get through that, that knot hole. Uh, be, be aware that recruiters, you know, aren't internal recruiters, aren't bad people. They just have, may have unacceptable workloads. Um, understand that you might be part of a plan B strategy. Uh, you could ask, but you may not never know. But when things do work well, you know, um, it's a beautiful thing. You apply, they work with you, you go in for the interview, you land the job. So, but that's the smaller percentage. So we're just about out of time. Um, so let me wrap up by saying, uh, you know, hey, please join us again um, on our next Optimize Your Career program on Saturday, September 8th at 8 a.m. You know, our next topic will be on choosing and managing your references, the many do's and don'ts with a few big surprises thrown in. This again is Ed Samuel, career coach with Sam Nova. Our website is www samnovainc.com s-a-m-n-o-v-a-i-n-c.com if you'd like to reach me with a question or comment email me at e-samuel e-s-a-m-u-e-l at samnovainc.com or call our main number at 610-274-8214 so make it a great weekend so long for now and god bless